So you're either thinking about starting a 501c3 charitable nonprofit or you're already in the process of doing so. One of the things you're going to have to decide on is what type of 501c3 it needs to be. Now, some of you might be thinking, I thought a 501c3 was a 501c3. Not exactly. There's actually three primary types, public charity, private foundation, and private operating foundation. And the choice you make greatly impacts how your nonprofit is structured and how it operates. We briefly introduced to this subject in our last video about the public support test. The public support test measures the percentage of donor support coming from the general public. Well, that test only applies to public charities, the first type of 501c3 we're going to look at today. Public charities represent the largest share of active 501c3 organizations. These are what I like to call the feet on the street organizations that are actually operating charitable programs. Examples of public charities include everything from the Red Cross to First Baptist Church to your local pet rescue. Those starting new organizations usually prefer public charity status, not just because it better fits the organization's purpose, but also because public charities enjoy some advantages over private foundations. We'll talk about these later on. The true definition of a public charity, though, goes well beyond the programs and into the realm of structure and revenue source. There are structural requirements necessary to qualifying as a public charity. These are usually addressed in the form of three specific tests, the purpose test, the organizational test, and the public support test. Let's look at each of these. The purpose test addresses the reason your nonprofit exists in the first place. What is its purpose? We're gonna be shooting another video in the future that goes into this idea of purpose in greater detail, but we can introduce it here. And ironically, the purpose test is the one test that applies to all 501c3 types. All charitable nonprofits, in order to be considered a 501c3, must be organized for exclusively charitable purposes as defined by the IRS. Those purposes are religious, scientific, usually in the form of scientific research, testing for public safety, literary, this is typically nonprofit publishing activity of some sort, educational, fostering national or international amateur sports, and prevention of cruelty to animals and children. There's also a roll-up purpose category the IRS simply refers to as charitable, which encompasses charitable activity that doesn't neatly fit into the ones I just rattled off. So, to pass the purpose test, your nonprofit needs to have as its primary mission a program that is best described by one of these purposes. The organizational test is one that exclusively applies to public charities. A public charity is required to govern itself at arm's length from its board members. Well, that means it must represent the public interest by having a diversified board of directors. The reason for this is that in exchange for the benefit of public charity status, the trade-off is less control for specific individuals. Now, in practical terms, how do you accomplish this? For starters, more than 50% of your board should be unrelated by blood, marriage, or outside business co-ownership, usually 35% or greater combined ownership stake and not be compensated as employees of the organization. We are often asked where this is in the code, and frankly, it isn't there, at least not verbatim. It is an extrapolation of the IRS's requirement that governance of a public charity be independent or arm's length and without unfair private benefit potential to insiders, a no-no that's called inurement. As such, the IRS requires that a majority of board members have no personal stake either directly or indirectly through relationship. Now, if part of your plan includes having all or most of your board made up of family or other related individuals, then you may want to look at a private foundation instead. As far as the public support test goes, we covered this topic in depth before, so be sure and check out that video. There's a link in the corner of your screen that will take you there, plus we've linked it in the description below. The short version is that a public charity must pass the public support test at least by year six of its existence then every year thereafter. A public charity needs a significant percentage of its income, usually 33% or more, coming from a broad base of donors who are individually giving less than 2% of total revenue, or from other public charities or from governmental sources. Now, let's shift our focus to private foundations. A private foundation is usually designed for the purpose of financially supporting other 501c3s, usually public charities, 
rather than directly operating charitable programs themselves. A benefit of private foundation status is that they are allowed to be closely held and closely funded. There are no regulations prohibiting majority control by family members or business partners, nor any requirement of fulfilling a public support test. While those sound like great things, and they are, it comes with trade-offs. For starters, private foundations are required to distribute at least 5% of their assets each year for a charitable purpose. There's also a small excise tax charged on investment earnings, something public charities don't have to deal with. Donations to private foundations, while potentially tax-deductible, are subject to more restrictions on tax benefit. And there are other issues to contend with as well, including the annual IRS Form 990PF filing, which can be a beast. Probably the biggest trade-off for being a private foundation is the heightened restriction on self-dealing. Insiders of a private foundation, referred to by the negative-sounding term disqualified persons, have strict limits applied to them with regard to financial interest in the organization. Disqualified persons include board members, people related to board members, and significant donors. While it is possible for a disqualified person to be employed by the foundation, it is a narrow and highly restrictive path. We'll deal with this topic more in depth in another video. Before we move on from the topic of private foundations, I don't want to leave the impression that private foundation status is somehow bad or lesser. It isn't. Most private foundations are formed because that particular structure is exactly what the founders desired. It's just that in exchange for the benefits, there are significant issues to consider. At first glance, a private operating foundation may seem to be a third broad category of 501c3 organization, but it's not. It's actually a subclassification of a private foundation. A private operating foundation is a private foundation that devotes most of its resources to the active conduct of one or more charitable programs, hence the term operating. More specifically, the IRS defines a private operating foundation as any private foundation that spends at least 85% of its adjusted net income or its minimum investment return, whichever is less, on these program activities. Now, I'm not going to get into the minutia of this and the other tests associated with being an operating foundation because they are complicated and hard to grasp by watching a video. We'll put a link in the description below to our article on the subject if you're interested. You'll never see the IRS use the term hybrid to describe a private operating foundation, but in effect, that's sort of what they are, a mashup of a private foundation and a public charity. Here's four reasons why. One, private operating foundations can have a closely held board structure just like a private foundation. That means the governing board could be all related by blood, marriage, or outside business co-ownership, unlike a public charity. Two, most private operating foundations tend to have a broad base of support similar to a public charity, but they're not required to. In other words, no public support test. Three, inherent to being a private operating foundation is the necessity to operate charitable programs. To the outsider, most would appear to be public charities. And four, operating foundations get a higher level of potential donor tax deductibility, much more like a public charity. With all of this, a private operating foundation sounds like the best of both worlds. It can be an attractive prospect, but in reality, very few 501c3s go this route. The math formulas required to qualify and maintain this status are tough and usually not worth the effort. If you really want to understand this better, check out the link in the description. I sort of teased this throughout the video, but I want to wrap up by looking at how donations to these three types of 501c3s are treated. In general, donations to public charities receive the most generous tax benefit. Donors are allowed to donate tax-deductibly up to 60% of their adjusted gross income. Of course, you can always give away more money than 60% of your income to a public charity. You just cannot write off more than 60%. An interesting footnote to this is that for the COVID years of 2020 and 2021, the limit was raised to 100%. Donations to private foundations are much more limited. Again, this is in trade-off for the higher level of control allowed. Donors can deduct giving to private foundations up to 30% of their adjusted gross income. Finally, let's consider operating foundations. They get a stepped-up deductible limit of 50% of adjusted gross income. Interestingly, public charities used to be at 50%, but they were raised to 60% in 2017. Not so for operating foundations. There's so much more we could say about this topic. In reality, we're really just scratching the surface of what the differences are in practical application. 
For most people, if you are running an active programmatic charity, it's probably going to be a public charity. If your organization is granting money to charitable programs operated by others, you're probably going to want to start a private foundation. And for the brave few of you, a private operating foundation just might be the ticket. Well, that's got us for today. Be sure and like this video, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and click the bell icon to be informed of new videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.